My name is Larissa Lamb, and I am um, on the steering committee of New Day Films. I am uh, the director of Far East Deep South, which is a film about Chinese in Mississippi during segregation and the Chinese exclusion era. I am a Ch Chinese female with, d with dark hair, pulled back in a ponytail, wearing a white turtleneck sweater against an orange and yellow backdrop that says Reframe and Refresh and New Day Films. We're grateful we've You've taken time out of your busy schedule for today's panel for Reframe and Refresh, which is New Day Films monthly series for the education and filmmaking commu community to have refreshing conversations that reframe our perspectives. And today's panel is once again hosted by New Day Films. And here to share more about New Day is our very own Kate Way. And Kate herself directed a, a fantastic film um, about immigration and uh, undocumented um, immigrants called Stop Time. Kate? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm honored to be here and to be able to introduce New Day. Uh, New Day Films is a unique filmmaker-run distribution cooperative providing award-winning films to educators, community groups, government agencies, public libraries, and businesses since 1971. Democratically run by more than 150 filmmaker members, New Day is committed to reflecting greater diversity, representation, and inclusion. New Day films have been broadcast on PBS, HBO, and other uh, many other media outlets. It's celebrating, we're celebrating over 50 years of delivering dynamic and provocative storytelling with filmmakers who have won hundreds of awards, including Emmys and Oscars. And today we're really happy to bring you two of the most recent titles in our collection. Thank you so much, Kate. And we'll get to know a couple of those titles a little bit more, Manifest Destiny Jesus and Not Your Model Minority. Um, if you're just joining us, um, once again, um, this is the Reframe and Refresh, uh, Dismantling Myths About Race. And for this conversation, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in the chat box, I wanna make sure we keep things courteous and a positive affirming environment. And I also know as people have asked questions about today's panel, um, we could fill several weeks, years worth of conversation about this topic alone. There are so many myths about race. Um, and we could also have many more panelists represented because we know there's so many different perspectives and there's so many different groups um, where there are myths about that need to be dismantled. Um, but today's discussion is not meant to be an exhaustive one on race. Um, we're not going to be able to fix racism in one hour. I wish we could, right? That would be amazing if we could fix racism in one hour. Um, but we're going to be just talking about some of the myths about the Black and Asian communities, um, as well as discuss broader issues about myths about race that impact all other communities. And in the limited time that we have today, you know, I really hope that our conversation will catalyze more conversation and prompt introspection, inspire action, and spur more learning beyond today. So with that, let's introduce our panelists. First up is Josh Asang. He is the co-director of Manifest Destiny. The film has played festivals in the U.S. and Canada and won the, won the Audience Award at the 2021 D.C. Black Film Festival. From 2012 to 2020, he served as literary manager, then associate assistant, or artistic director at Book It Repertory Theater in Seattle, where he supported the development of dozens of world premiere stage adaptations direct, and directed two of them. He is the member of the Lincoln Center Directors Lab, graduate of NYU's Tisch School of Arts, and an avid marathoner and a dedicated dad of two. Welcome, Josh Asang. And his partner in creativity uh, in making of this film is T. Geronimo Johnson, the co-director of Manifest Destiny Jesus. In addition, he is an award-winning writer. His novels have been included on Time Magazine's list of the top 10 books and awarded the Saoyang, Sa Sa um, I apologize if I, if I mispronounce that, International Prize for Writing, among other honors. And Johnson has taught at UC Berkeley, Stanford, the writers, I'm sorry, and has taught at UC Berkeley, Stanford, the Writers' Workshop, and the Prague Summer Program, Oregon State University, San Quentin, Texas State, and elsewhere. 
Welcome, Geronimo. And he's actually coming in from uh, Italy. <laughs> so he may be the one that's furthest away. Um, John Asaki, I'd like to welcome. He is the director of Not Your Model Minority. He is an award winning filmmaker who's directed and produced a promotional, educational, narrative, and documentary films. His initial interest in film grew from his desire to share the stories of the Japanese community youth council where he has served as executive director since 1996 and over the past few years he has had film screened at film festivals community events across the country and as a filmmaker john views the genre as the next step in his lifelong pursuit of social justice and equal and equity thanks john for being here and last but not least, we have Dr. Candace Robinson, who is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She earned her sociology degrees from Hampton University, University of Iowa, and University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Robinson's research agenda is motivated by a commitment to understanding the contributions of the black middle class and black elite to the long civil, longstanding civil rights organization, the National Urban League and American society in general. Her work has far reaching implications in the areas of race, class, social inequality, social movements and Africana studies. Welcome Dr. Robinson, AKA Candace <laughs> to this conversation. All right, let's show something visual besides our faces um, with a trailer um, from Manifest Destiny, Jesus, uh, which examines portraying Jesus as a white, as white, how portraying Jesus as white has reinforced cultural divides from the colonial era up through modern period of rampant gentrification, segregated churches, and police violence. And I believe we're showing the the trailer for Manifest Destiny Jesus. Do we have that queued up? Yes, we do. Black folks move out, white folks move in. Donut shop. Crossfits. Kombucha. I can't even afford to live in here. But I never will forget that the big book on the coffee table with this white guy on it. But he black. He was down with the hookers. Seriously? Uh -huh. Really? Are you talking about Jesus from The Walking Dead? Or are you talking about Jesus on the cross? I've never seen that many white people walk by. <laughs> and he calls me Black Jesus. It was translucent. Wow, this neighborhood's really up and coming. You know, which means getting nicer, which means feeling safer, which means, you know. We've been here 40 years. White Jesus is a critical tool of white supremacy. Powerful stuff. Um, I love the title of the film, by the way, Manifest Destiny Jesus. So Josh and Geronimo, what prompted you to explore this myth of a white Jesus in your film? Feel free to take it well, first, Josh. <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, so uh, Geronimo and our other uh, filmmaker, creative partner, uh, Damon and I, we'd all been uh, uh, talking about projects that we would want to work on together. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a focus of our collective work is to like really examine like the deeper, uh, as Geronimo says, the deeper social programming, uh, our collective deeper social programming. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we all have in common, of course, is a uh, background in, you know, being raised in the Christian church. And, um, uh, Damon and Geronimo, both in the Catholic Church, uh, I in the Lutheran Church, and my father is actually uh, a retired Lutheran minister. Uh, and we were, were talking about, uh, you know, I mean, I guess the conversation wasn't all that interesting, but somehow or another, we stumbled upon talking about uh, this church in, uh, the, in my community that I was attending irregularly, uh, and how they had worked together as a congregation to cover up the stained, their stained glass image of a white Jesus. Uh, and that, that was the, you know, spark that, um, 
sort of caught all of the other kindling, as it were, of our ideas um, and uh, and felt like a um, sort of a, a defining narrative that we could talk about a lot of this other stuff that we had been discussing in our um, in our creative conversations. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting to hear how that all kind of came to be. And Geronimo, did you want to add to that? You know, I, I think probably, uh, I think Josh has summed it up nicely. The only thing that, that I would add to it maybe is uh, that I have an abiding interest in the influ influences of which we're not aware. Kurt Kagard says that it's the influences of which we're unconscious that hold the greatest sway over us. And so um, it, it definitely felt as if this falls under that category of influences. Yeah, and speaking of that influence, um, Candace, um, if you can help kind of expand why and how that G that why Jesus myth has influenced other myths about race. Yeah, I really enjoyed having an opportunity to check out this documentary and this film. It was phenomenal. If you have an opportunity, you absolutely should watch this because it does an excellent job of tracing lines between things that we sometimes forget impact us. So, for example, during the civil rights movement, Mamie and Kenneth Clark did this study called the doll test where they saw where they had children say, what is the good doll? What is the bad doll? And generally the kids would say the good doll is the white doll. And very similarly, if we think of Jesus as being the person that we need to be like, to be closer to, we're gonna want to subconsciously be closer to whiteness, which can be a problem, especially when we think about what our opportunities in our communities can be. The other thing that I thought about while watching this um, is I recently came across this article that talked about Catholicism and what happens when we canonize, when um, people of color become saints. And historically, they would say in the little card that talked about them becoming saints that their faces turned white. So even in our real lives, we we as in people of color don't get an opportunity to be good unless we're white. And because of all of the different ways that uh, these biases pop up in ways that we don't even recognize, it becomes institutionalized in things like gentrification. When it's gentrification, we want things with nice white walls. Whiteness becomes a parallel for what we think is right even though many of us are, not many of us, all of us are just as fine as people of color, even if our skin is not white. Yeah, no, thanks for that insight. I, I mean, I know I growing up in a, in a Chinese church, the photo of Jesus was also white. And, you know, if you actually dove into scriptures, you know, he's from the Middle East. And so there's uh, definitely, you know, the European influence of art, right, where Jesus was portrayed in that, you know, in, in that image that has kind of infiltrated, I think, all aspects of society around the world. Um, Josh and Geronimo, um, one aspect, you know, as Candace has mentioned, that you focus on in your film is about gentrification. Can you expand a little bit more about that? You know, what are the myths that are you hoping to dispel through your examination of white Jesus and gentrification? You know, I... I feel like in in a capitalist society, we um, we assign a certain moral value to financial success. Uh, intellectually, we know it's not synonymous with financial success, but when we start to think about minorities and minority achievement, minority wealth, and uh, other material um, evidence of uh, of gain. There's, I think, an assumption often made that because historically Black people may not have earned as much money, may not have um, experienced home ownership at the same rate, et cetera, et cetera, that these, these um, financial markers are evidence of some kind of moral failing or failing of character. They're just not working hard enough. They're just not making the best decisions. They're just not making the right decisions. And when we when we look at gent gentrification, it becomes an opportunity for us to, I think, um, unpack some of those assumptions because there are certainly a lot of uh, structural 
influences at play. But I also think that, um, especially at this moment in, in history, when we're all hopefully a little bit um, wiser about what globalization has looked like, so to speak, over the last five or 600 years, gentrification also becomes a metaphor that can prompt us to think more critically about colonialism, even in its many forms, ranging from settler colonialism, you know, through the entire continuum of practices that involve these sometimes unfortunate collisions between cultures. So on one hand, we wanted to specifically unpack and explore what we have experienced as our common history in America, but also hopefully provide a context that would um, prompt people to, to think more broadly, right, about how things are working historically and in contemporary uh, societies and economies. Yeah, I think it's a really important point that you make that people tend to assign you know, prejudgment to certain neighborhoods because of the ethnic makeup, you know, of a neighborhood. Um, and and I think your your film and, and you opening that conversation is very important. Um, we're going to turn over to uh, the next myth we want to also focus on is the model minority myth. And let's take a look at the trailer from Not Your Model Minority um, by John Osaki. Um, it explores the myth and the intersections with past and present anti-Asian violence. The film reveals the ways the model minority myth has been used to create a wedge between communities of color, while also examining opportunities to build power towards addressing systemic racism in America. Let's take a look at that trailer. They work their way past column A's and column B's, past no starch please, to become our nation's model minority. Forget poor huddled masses, this wave of immigrants is highly educated and successful. You know, the country overall has been so poisoned by this notion of the model minority racist myth. We were offered limited access and privileges towards proximity to whiteness, and the exchange is that you have to allow society to use you. It's just factually incorrect. One moment we're being held up as a model minority, the next minute we're an existential threat. Tonight a dangerous virus now spreading rapidly in China. There's new video tonight of another brutal attack on an Asian American. Of the eight victims tragically killed in the Atlanta mass shooting, six were women of Asian descent. John, um, some people say being perceived as the model minority isn't a bad thing. I know I've heard that before. You know, oh, wh why, why don't you like that, that, that stereotype? Why was it important to you to push back against that myth and peel back the layers surrounding this myth? So the, the origins of the model minority myth really go back to the response that uh, many Asian Americans had following historical events like the Chinese Exclusion Act, like the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. And for many, the common held belief was to survive in America, you had to keep your head down, you had to not complain or speak out, right? And you had to work hard, right? And that was the way to survive um, and find your place in America. So that narrative though got weaponized during the civil rights era and it was used as a, a way in which to criticize um, the black community for their efforts in leading the civil rights era and really kind of painted this picture of uh, this is what a good minority looks like or community of color and this is what and obviously that was in contrast to this is what a bad one looks like and i think I, you know, this film was actually, um, I was engaged to produce it by a coalition of civil rights organizations like the Urban League, the Advancement Project, Race Forward, the Asian Pacific Islander, American Health Forum, because that they saw the value of community colors, of communities of color working together to address systemic racism. And I think that the, this myth in particular um, was created to divide communities of color. And I, I do always like to point out the fact that um, as this myth was being created during the civil rights era, um, one of the political leaders who had a front row seat to um, what was happening in particular in the Bay Area in San Francisco 
with the student strikes of young people from the Black community, Asian community, Latinx community, Native community coming together to create ethnic studies in this country, right? And the person who had a front row seat to that was Ronald Reagan, who happened to be governor of California at that time. And he saw the power of that. You know, it really changed the face of education, um, these communities coming together. And so he and others, many others, worked very intentionally to keep communities of color divided, right? And so that's why I think in, in particular for Asian Americans, it's so important to understand that subscribing to this myth um, is really being used by those who promote white supremacy and systemic racism in this country. And so that's why I felt uh, it was so important to push back against this and to really educate people about where and how this was really created um, as part of a way to really suppress and push back against the civil rights movement in this country. Yeah, and you know, what's interesting about, as we're talking about myths, like myths can kind of change for different groups. You know, you're talking about the model minority myth that was created, but if you look back, you know, almost a hundred years prior to that, when the Chinese Exclusion Act prior to that, the myth was Chinese and Asians were dirty, they were heathens, they were disease filled, they were gonna infect you. There was like a different type of myth. So it's interesting how uh, myths can change. Um, Candace, can you discuss a little bit why, you know, uh, that knowing some of those origins, knowing where they come from is important? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like you need to understand where the origins of these things are in order to understand the historical, social, and political landscapes that have developed to today. So for me, when I was growing up, I heard the stories of Manifest Destiny and the Founding Fathers, and you see the footnotes of the Chinese and African-Americans um, and Latinx people within the United States, but they're not necessarily the stars of the show. They're just, you know, additive to the American story. So when you get to a contemporary understanding of what's going on, they're still not the stars of the show. They're seen as additive in support of white supremacy and what whiteness wants to be done. So if you're thinking about something like model minority, you're not also taking into consideration the amount of hard work that Asian people have done throughout the country. It's again, in service to how can we pit these communities against one another? But if you look back to the 1960s in the way that communities of color work together and we're mobilizing and we're very interested in seeing how our experiences were much more shared than different, you're in a better position to understand why there may be uh, particular tensions between communities of color in California come the 1990s. You get to understand why there may be tensions um, in New York City contemporarily or in Atlanta and so on and so forth. So uh, typically when I'm teaching in sociology, we start having conversations about dates, what happened here, what happened then, what happened there, and those help to contextualize for people that things just don't pop up spontaneously. This is when I tell my students that I often feel like uh, a conspiracy theorist because we're putting all of these different things on the board and seeing in actuality, if you pay attention to what has happened, you can understand why Black people are seen as lazy or Asian people are seen as the model minority because you're hyper fixating on these individual moments as opposed to looking at the constellation of moments that show us for today. Yeah, no, that's that's well put. Um, anything to add from Josh Geronimo or, or John? Well, I'll just add that, you know, part of what has really helped perpetuate this myth is that um, in this country in 1965, the the Immigration Act reopened the doors to Asian immigration in this country, but only to those that America wanted in this country. And so what you had was this immigration of folks who were privileged, who were doctors and engineers and people who were highly educated. And so with that wave of immigration, they did not have the historical context of the civil rights movement of the past harms um, that were targeted towards Asian American communities. And so they very much come into this country and continue to perpetuate this myth. And I think that there is a tremendous amount of work. I talk all the, all the time about the fact that we have to find ways to educate each other um, and provide, you know, 
as Dr. Robinson just shared, we really have to not just look at singular moments, but really understand how we got here, right? How we arrived at this moment and, and be very mindful of intentional efforts that want to uh, keep us divided, that want to keep us in silos, um, and that want to make sure that we are not working together. Because the fact is, is that if our communities can find ways and opportunities to work together, we have more power than a lot of people are comfortable with in this country. Yeah, and I definitely feel like with the model minority myth, it does a disservice to those who don't come in privilege. There is huge refugee community, um, as you point out, John, in your film, um, that is here. There are working class and underclass uh, people and, and, and some that are being exploited um, in labor in this country that, again, you if you lump everybody in the same category, um, it does a disservice to those who are actually um, in need uh, as well. Um, Josh and Geronimo, um, you know, you have so many great themes and 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 information and you know amazing facts that you point out in your film. What are some ways that um, you have been using your films to help change people's perspective? If you can give some examples and what the impact has been so far. I, I would like very much to not answer that question just yet and uh, back up for a minute and kind of tag on to something that. John said that um, um, started uh, percolating up when Dr. Robinson was speaking. And, you know, we, we use this term of myth, this term myth, I think that for us, it accurately describes that something is not necessarily real. But when we think about um, myth in a larger context, like thinking about religious context and whatnot, the fact that something may not be real uh, historically, it doesn't mean that it's not experienced as reality. And so sometimes I, I, I worry that when we talk about myths, we forget that these beliefs have currency and they have power and they're encoded in the law and they are activated and executed with intention. And I'm thinking about going all the way back to uh, Bacon's Rebellion when black and white workers side by side uh, started an uprising because they weren't being treated fairly. And then it was shortly after that that we saw a rise in um, laws that were particularly harsh, uh, directed only towards Black people. And uh, we now call them the, the Black Codes. And we're, we're aware of these Black Codes. The interesting thing about it, though, is that at the same time the Black Codes are introduced, there are all, also there's also an introduction of additional penalties for white people who fall like out of line and say, if you marry someone who's black, right, your, your child might be a slave in perpetuity. If a person who's white runs away with someone who's black, they're going to be in a lot more trouble than they would if they just ran off with someone who's, who's white. And so it, it, it feels like uh, to me what I'm hoping for now to come back around to the question sometimes is that when, when, we, when we're in the classroom and we start to talk about these things, we're, getting, um, we're able to get to a place where people can actually think not just about uh, history, but really about what it means to be a free thinking individual, right? Because I, I think that hate and stereotype is also an affliction of the soul, not necessarily in a spiritual way, but I think it's an affliction that that really stifles what it means to be a human being on this planet. So one of the things that we're, we're aiming for is not just a, a shift in thinking, but hopefully a shift in being, which is very much what this whole planet is in need of right now, you know, without going into a cul-de-sac about the, the climate crisis, right? So I feel like that this is what we're, we're trying to do, just like inch us all forward just a little bit at a time. Yeah, well put and great transition. Come bringing it back. <laughs> um, Josh and John, um, would, would you like to add to, to how your films are being used or how you see your films being used? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, in the, 
I think in the classroom um, that the, you know, that the lines that we're, we're drawing, uh, you know, between as, um, as Dr. Robinson was saying earlier, like historical events and then, um, you know, personal impact, you know, or social impact um, because of maybe, um, you know, housing policy, for example, after the war, um, that if we can, if we can more clearly it, you know, articulate the dominoes of how these things uh, fall. Uh, I think that we can that we can better understand. Um, I think we can better understand the the impact of um, of it on our society. Uh, one way that I that I'm proud of the film has been has been utilized is also by churches um, because I think that the uh, the congregation in this um, in this film. Uh, can model for model or inspire other congregations to have these what I what I think sometimes for certain congregations are difficult conversations even for churches that we've we've screened it at where they're very open and very receptive to it uh, it can still be a difficult conversation and that this provides um, a a conduit for them to more easily have those conversations. Yeah, no, that's that's great to hear. I was just going to add really quickly that so we had a chance to um, screen this film in Washington, D.C., and a, a student who caught the film uh, contacted me right afterwards, and she was raised in a, an Asian immigrant family, and she shared with me how she was always taught to be seen and not heard um, and to to basically subscribe to this model minority myth, and that's the way to ascend in this country. But after seeing my film, she s understood how perpetuating this idea that there are good and bad minorities really does harm other communities, right? And it really does uphold uh, those who promote systemic racism in this country. And so she contacted me and arranged for a screening at her school in Memphis, Tennessee. And so I think, you know, that was a real example of how it really, you know, I, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to really change perspectives, right? And really attack these myths directly where people sort of have these aha moments and sort of understand how they are actually upholding uh, systemic racism in this country by subscribing to them. And that's what I love. I know there are many filmmakers in our audience as well. It is as a community, we can show people a different side in it through a different medium that they may not, you know, think about. Um, and and I know um, Dr. Robinson um, in teaching and discussing race in the classroom on campuses. You know, what are some best practices and approaches that you recommend? Because as mentioned before, as Josh was saying, like it could be a hard conversation to have, and and it could be sometimes even people who are receptive, you know, challenging to navigate these waters. Yeah, I think there's first off, there's no right way to have these discussions. Well, the right way is to make sure that there are group agreements and that people agree that you know we're going to have civil discussion, we're going to be open minded. But after that, there's no right way. One thing, one of the many things I like to do in my class is to show documentaries or pieces of documentaries to also check where students are within the classroom. What do you know already? Or what do you think you know? What do your classmates know or think they know? What don't they know? And making it a safe space to recognize that there's a lot of narratives that we just don't have access to. It may be intentionally in the curriculum, or it may be there was just not enough time in the curriculum. Your major may be mad and they're not having conversations. There's a lot of reasons why there's a lot of information that we don't quite know yet. But it's important to recognize that a classroom is a space where you can come in and not know and have an opportunity to have cross-cultural communications. One of the things we know on college campuses is that a lot of college campuses are still racially divided where students stay within their same racial groups. And a lot of times the classroom is the only time that they're talking to people who are not like them. Gender-wise as well, we find that people are able to come to classroom and experience a lot of different people. So creating that safe space, reminding them that no one knows everything 
everything and using the resources that are available. When I was in college, YouTube, when I was an undergraduate, YouTube was just starting. But now as a faculty member, recognizing that we can use clips from YouTube, uh, documentary filmmakers has spent a lot of time and energy making these things. And those are resources to start the conversation. And in addition to having these uh, technological resources is going back and looking again at the history dates. What are um, key moments in history politically, socially? What are these moments? We talk about the civil rights movement. When does it start? When does it end? Do you incorporate Asian Americans in the civil rights movement? So just making sure that the conversation is open and there are no dumb questions. That way, when people leave the room, um, they're leaving with a more informed information. Because all, the last thing I'll say is we're all busy. So you can throw all the books you want at students, but really people just want an opportunity to talk talk and to be heard. And I think that's even more important to make sure that people feel heard as they are trying to figure out, wait, am I a bad person? It's like, no, you're not a bad person. We're just trying to figure out how can we make sure that you are a more well-informed one. Yeah, no, that's well put. And, you know, you bring up a great point when you're talking about YouTube. You're talking about the good things that YouTube and innovation and, and say social media can do. So I'm going to take it to the dark side a little bit. When we're talking about myths, I mean, unfortunately, in this day and age, there seems to be a proliferation of misinformation, especially as it spreads through social media. So this is a question for all of you. So how can all of us, um, you know, you mentioned Dr. Robinson, you mentioned a few of them. How can we all uh, better combat these untruths? Um, who wants to jump in first, John, Josh or Geronimo? I, I probably should not jump in first on this. I'm not very optimistic about this particular problem, and it's because I did an empirical study on this uh, when I was in grad school at Berkeley, and what I consistently found is that people were not um, very skilled at determining the veracity of anything they watched if they didn't already know a lot about it. And so they would often choose to decide or decide that something is true or not true based on past experience or based on belief, whether or not they wanted to believe it's true. So it seems like um, what, what we're really trying to do sometimes is increase the amount of, we might say, actual factual information as a way to counter the sheer quantity of misinformation, but that um, even more importantly, what we're trying to do often in the classroom is to, to both provoke and model a way of thinking. And it's, and it's, you know, the thing is the end game isn't for someone to watch our film and say, oh yeah, I get it. Jesus wasn't white, right? That's, that's just, a very small step. The end game is that someone says, oh, I, I get it. I believe this thing all my life and I never questioned it. Or I lived with this kind of inconsistency that I was aware of on some level and I never questioned it. And what else am I not questioning? Like what else am I accepting at face value without interrogating? To what extent am I just running the program that's been given to me? So I feel like we're, we're really, um, charged with the very difficult task of teaching or modeling different ways of thinking about what's going on and trying to at times divorce that uh, way of thinking from being based solely in emotion, preset emotion, while at the same time giving a plug for kindness. Because so I think kindness is very underrated. And, you know, this is what we're trying to move towards a kinder world. Absolutely. Um, can we just have you run the world then? No. <laughs> no, kindness, I think, can lead to truth, right? Um, Josh, were you going to jump in and say something? No, I mean, I think that, well, Geronimo captures so much of it so well. I think that um, it this is one of those things that really overwhelms me. Um, and I find that um, it, it might be hot, but like, I, I have kids and like, I know that I can, I can teach them uh, how to like, you know, source information. I think so much of this as, as maybe unsatisfying as it is, it has to like spread out from us individually, like in our, in our classrooms, you know, teaching, especially, especially, you know, what are the, what are the 
you know, folks like young, young people, like technological natives, like everybody who's growing up with all of this information that I, that I think is safe to assume none of us grew up with on this, on this panel, right. That like, uh, trying to uh, raise up individuals to to really uh, look for the veracity and how do you, you know how do you teach them to uh, look for the veracity of information um, but it is I, I find this um, I as well as Geronimo I'm not terribly optimistic about it 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 feels overwhelming um, but we have to look forward we have to think that there is hope. Otherwise, there's no point in doing the work that we're doing, right, to, to make that change if we don't think that it is actually going to change. John, you're nodding. Did you want to add something? Well, I just wanted to offer, and this might be pie in the sky and dreaming a little bit, but I, you know, I will go to my grave believing that we just have to build an army of, of truth and hope in this country. And we have to recruit as many members to that army as we can. And we have to continue to speak it whenever and wherever we have opportunities to do that. And I think that's why so many of us make films um, to make sure that we amplify these stories of truth um, and to, to stay at it as voraciously as those who want to spread false information in this country. And that's a very, simplistic way i think to approach it but that's what that's what i believe that's why i make films that's why i have these conversations in communities that frankly aren't used to seeing people like me or having difficult conversations but because i believe that that's what it's going to take um and you know my um not that i want to make a uh to promote this but my next film is about um, promoting ethnic studies in this country Right. And the battle that is before us right now in trying to make sure that it is offered at younger levels, that it is part of core curriculum and not additive to what young people learn. And so that's where I'm placing a lot of of my energy moving forward. Yes, absolutely. And we're totally behind you on that. As um, I get all those looks when people find out Chinese were in Mississippi, what, during segregation, <laughs> uh, which opens up a lot of conversation. Um, we have some questions that are coming in through our chat. But before we get to our Q&A um, from our audience, and if you do have a question, please put it in the chat and we'll try to get as to as many questions as we can for our panelists. Um, we have a few announcements we'd like to share with you. And I'm going to bring back um, Kate Wei from New Day Films to to share some of these announcements before we get into our Q&A with the audience. Great, um, thank you for that amazing conversation. So interesting. Uh, so by way of a few announcements, we want to remind people that uh, New Day Films offers a variety of ways to stream our diverse collection of films, including those dealing with ethnic studies. Uh, and to see uh, more about that, visit our, our website, um, newday.com and to see our full collection of films. Uh, also, follow us on social media, um, on, uh, speaking of social media, on uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, and Instagram. And uh, we'll drop those, um, those addresses in the chat. And finally, the films that were featured today are, are um, available on New Day and We'll drop the links to those specifically in the chat as well. And both of these films are also available on Canopy for Higher Education. So you can look for them there as well. And finally, we want to say that if you are a filmmaker interested in joining New Day, um, we have monthly webinars um, to tell you more about the, um, the co-op and the next one is happening on um, Wednesday, April 5th at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern and uh, 8 a.m. Pacific. And we'll also drop a link to that as well in the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. And I am going to go back to our panelists and our questions. And if after these, after this Q and A, um, uh, we will, if time allows, I'll let the the panelists give in a, a final word. Um, but we have a question for Geronimo specifically. Can you share the Kierkegaard quote? 
Uh, yes, I'll have to look it up again and then put it in the in the chat. Yeah. And by the way, um, any links that were shared in our chat um, or any resources that our panelists shared, we can we will email everybody who's registered afterwards. So Geronimo, if you want to email me the quote afterwards, I can send it to everyone. That might be easiest. Okay. Um, this question um, is definitely a pointed question. Uh, my friend keeps sending me black on Asian crimes. How do I alleviate that crimes happen no matter the color of the person? I don't know if John or um, Candace wants to take this. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to take this. I think that there are, as we just talked about, right, there are ethnic medias who are perpetuating these uh, false narratives about what's really happening in this country. Um, and I take every opportunity I can to share the fact that, um, you know, 80% of the violence that has been directed towards Asian Americans are from white males, right? And so this is a purely false narrative that is being put out by the media, perpetuated by so many images that are played over and over again. And, you know, we really have to have the information and the data to refute these, these, these types of intentional efforts, I'm going to bring it back again, to divide us, right? And it may not even be conscious in the minds of those who are sharing this information, but it is something that, you know, it, I think we all have to ask ourselves, you know, why are those types of images played over and over again in the media? Why are we constantly exposed to them when they are very isolated um, incidences, right? And as somebody whose family was my mother and father were both incarcerated during war, World War II based on a completely false narrative. I know that I have to be critical of the things that I see and hear and make sure that I understand that no community is a monolith, right? And that it is so important to treat every, per, every person as an individual. And I think that's something that we have to, as a society, start to promote so that we don't generalize the images we see as applying to entire groups of people. Yeah, and I would add similarly that you have to ask your friends, why are you sharing this? Um, as has been discussed today, is, is that just confirmation bias for what you want to believe? Or is it something else going on? And oftentimes, um, it's normally confirmation bias. So depending on how close of a friend it is, if you care about their opinion, um, if we're being optimistic, we care because we want everyone to be more informed. But asking, you know, why are you sharing this in particular? Does that negate other experiences? And nine times out of 10, it's not negating the fact that there are these other things that John was bringing up, that there are other interactions with um, non-Black and non-Asian communities where you see similar things happening. So throwing the question back and remembering that sometimes numbers lie too, and some, especially when it's not telling the full story of what's going on. Thank you for your thoughts. I have many thoughts on that, but I, <laughs> I, we know we have more questions to get to. Um, but the, you know, the main point is, I think, um, not generalizing experiences and showing people a larger sampling size of the community. I, I think is important. Um, here's a question for I think all of you. Do you have any suggestions for engaging audiences who may be unengaged or borderline? Uh, borderline resistant to discussing viewing films related to ethnic experiences. I'll take a shot at it. Sure. <laughs> uh, I think we're all just kind of stunned to silence of not even really knowing where to start, because if they're resistant to even coming to understand ethnic experiences, then it's even more difficult to really get them to watch and hear, not just to not just watch, but you really need to, or not just to listen, but to really hear what people are saying. Um, so I think help having opportunities where they can share their experiences too may be another way to say, okay, great, we've heard your experiences, but what are some experiences that are not heard in the space and thinking of it more as a dialogue, as an approach. It may not solve it, but I'd love to find out um, what you all end up doing and what works. Another question we have is, 
how does networking with other like-minded individuals for unity impact our culture? Well, I think that to create a movement, you have to build a critical mass of people who are interested in finding and sharing the truth um, as widely as possible. So I think any opportunities there have, I know that my um, collaboration with uh, legal institutions, educational institutions, community groups is has been very effective, right, in kind of connecting the dots and bringing communities together in this conversation that might not otherwise be able to engage in it. And so I, you know, I'm a big believer and, you know, it sounds cliche, but, you know, the way that we're going to make progress against systemic racism is by working together. And the more we can find opportunities to do that, the more we're going to make progress in that, you know, the ongoing battle in this country. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was just going to add to that. I found that sometimes we try to reach for the person that you think like absolutely needs to hear the message. And a lot of times you have to start with those who are aligned with you most and, you know, or even those who are like kind of in the middle and kind of grow it from there. Um, we got more questions here. Um, this is for the filmmakers. Is there anything you wish you had included in your film, but ended up on the editing floor? Can I go back to the last question? Sure, absolutely. Okay, you know, because um, this this uh, I would have this problem a lot, um, especially when I was teaching, uh, like freshman comp, where you're really trying to get people to open their minds, and it it feels like um, when we know that or we think we know that someone needs something and they're resistant to it, that often the the best approach is indirect. And we might be we might be tempted to just kind of use this tactic of repetition in order to, to bring them in. But there's so many other ways to get people involved in conversations. And, and Dr. Robinson was was uh, talking about that a little just a, a moment ago. And so, I, you know, we we only know so much from the chat. But I feel like if if the audience is actually already in the space, one of the first things that has to happen is they often have to move their bodies. And there are a lot of exercises you do where you have people move around the room history. And at the end of this sorting through the space, people actually have a new embodied sense of their place on the continuum of, of privilege. If they're not in the room, and this is more so about enticement and, you know, they, you think they don't want to hear it. I think this is when you have to use all of these indirect ways. The thing is that a lot of this stuff is kind of didactic. There's a good chance that everyone who's here on this panel and everyone who's listening knows most of what we're talking about. So we're the choir. We're just singing to ourselves in our angelic voices, maybe. But when we're, when we're trying to pull people in in other ways, I, I think this is where maybe we can think about making the, the meeting or the gathering festive or celebratory. You know, the thing is, if what we're really after is a, is a better world, the path to that better world, when we come together to discuss these things, doesn't have to be dour and it doesn't have to be a space in which we're like belaboring things that people already know. We can make progress through joy. We can make progress through coming together and doing things that people enjoy. So I think that this is something we forget when we're talking about how to engage audiences, that if you can avoid being didactic, and this is why I went into writing novels and not nonfiction, if you can avoid being didactic, that's when you pull people in. All of the great religious traditions they're not, they have lists in them, but they're not big book of books of lists. They have stories. They have humans at the center, right? And we're all, and, and that's how we make that connection. So I just wanted to pop back to that for a minute. Well, and, and actually in looking at the clock, I actually think that's a perfect note to end on <laughs> for today, Geronimo. I'm sorry, we didn't get to the answer of, of what you can um, cut out of your film, but Though those of you who are watching, feel free to reach out to our filmmakers through our New Day um, 
New Day website. Um, they would love to, I think, answer your question if you're interested in learning on what they had to leave on the cutting room floor or any other questions. Uh, we are so grateful today for having Josh Asang, uh, T. Geronimo Johnson, co-directors of Manifest Destiny here with us, as well as John Osaki, director of Natural Model Minority, and Dr. Candace Robinson, who added so much to the conversation and context and gave some really wonderful um, tips for the classroom. Um, we will share some of the, the links and the Kierkegaard quote, among other things, um, in, in a follow-up email to all of you. And yes, hopefully, as long as technology, technology didn't fail us, we did record this so that we can share this conversation um, with you afterwards, um, after we have it uploaded onto our YouTube page. Um, and if you are interested in more refreshing conversation, um, like this one, uh, we'll be doing another one next month in April. Uh, the panelists will be to be announced. Um, and as I mentioned at the top, this conversation could fill hours and hours and hours, and there's so much more to explore. So we hope this is just the beginning of conversation that you carry on beyond today. Um, and we hope you've given we've given you some food for thought. Okay. Don't forget to follow us um, at on new, on social media for New Day and go to our website newday.com to check out trailers. If you'd like to license the films for educational purposes for the classroom, they are available there. And both films are available on the education platforms on Canopy. Um, thank you once again for being with us today. We will see you next time.